Okay, so coming back to this, talk a little bit about the uh, filtering mechanism that exists today in relation to social media. Choosing here just uh, Facebook or Meta as one uh, case study, though we could talk about other case studies as well. As I say, one of the consequences of the digital revolution um, involves the um, transmission of information, storage of information, access to information, and also the amount of information that is now available. And we might say, well, information about what? Well, all sorts of things. You could talk about uh, global events or esoteric interests or specific things. Um, I mean, it's pretty encompassing in terms of uh, the uh, information that's available, but also I would say information about you as well. That's a kind of another avenue for the information that exists online in the uh, social media world. This basically gets into what social media is all about. In terms of uh, gathering information about a vast uh, network, a vast array of uh, users. Now, of course, these social media companies are uh, very good at creating these algorithms that are able to tap into people's likes and uh, dislikes and their friends and uh, their interests. And this is where the filtering mechanism comes in. There is this tendency to filter information at particular people that is catered for that specific person. It is remarkable using these algorithms, using data, it is remarkable the extent to which social media companies can determine in advance what someone will like and what they will dislike. Their political affiliations, their interests, the kinds of things that they do, all those things. It's this idea of kind of breaking an individual down into these piecemeal uh, components, and that becomes a big part of this filtering process. You want to send information at people that they are going to like and respond to. And of course, the more you engage with it, the easier it is to do that. There's no reason to send information at someone that they are going to dislike because the tendency in most situations is to simply ignore it. And so this kind of uh, channeling process uh, reaches a kind of more and more intense uh, level. Social media companies are, of course, very uh, interested in finding out uh, about a person's uh, likes and interests uh, because they are, after all, giant advertising mechanisms. So it's not just about targeting information at you, but also about selling you stuff. Kind of seeing the sorts of products that will uh, mesh with your interests and uh, your worldview. And that, I would say, has ramped up in uh, recent years. I think it goes a long way towards explaining the um, polarization that has started to come into politics more and more. Of course, there are many other issues at play there, but part of this is precisely this filtering mechanism where people only receive information that pertains to um, their already existing existing interests. It's like becoming locked in a smaller and smaller uh, world, precisely because the algorithm is targeting you in a very uh, specific way. You may also note this uh, link between advertising and uh, information, which the social uh, media world uh, basically thrives on. The idea that information itself is in some respects a kind of uh, consumable product, something that you should uh, pay for. Now that kind of is the idea of newspaper subscriptions. In a sense, when you sign up for them, you're paying for information. But here's a very important point to always keep in mind. Information is free. It is, by definition, free. Now, there can be different ways to receive information, but the actual data and facts don't have a monetary value attached to them. It's all about the access that you have to it. And the attempts to actually try to attach a monetary value to information seem to have negative consequences overall because ultimately newspapers and social media companies are not actually selling people information, rather they are selling them products or even emotional viewpoints. In fact, I would wager that something that happens when you try to attach a money value to uh, information is that it ceases to matter if the information is true or not because you're not actually selling people true facts. This is another kind of um, principle here to give you a sense of um, the way the flow of information is changing in our society through the process of digitization. Again, focusing on meta just because this is a kind of pertinent uh, contemporary um, example. You see one of the kind of uh, mottos of this company, move fast and um, break things. 
Basically, what that means is that Facebook has a model, has followed a model of implementing innovations and features first and dealing with the consequences in, later. In effect, if the company wants to test a new product, it does so on the uh, general public. Now, this is certainly a change that digitization has brought about. Time was, if a company was going to introduce a new product, it would be a slow, painstaking process where they'd have to gather together focus groups, they'd have to bring people together to test the product because there was no reason to introduce something, introduce a new product or feature if it wasn't going to catch on. So there'd be a long lead up to that. Not in the digital world, not with a company like Meta. If they want to introduce a new feature, just introduce it like that. And thus you have millions of people suddenly engaging with the product that you first introduced. If they like it, they'll use it. If they don't like it, they won't use it. It's simple as that. So you don't need a focus group. Just run the experiment on the general population. That's been Zuckerberg's model basically since the start of Facebook. It's obviously got the company into trouble on several occasions because they've introduced features or things that have had dire consequences, online streaming services, or things that have involved uh, troll farms, or even election interference. I mean, it's reached quite large levels, and of course, they've had their um, wrists uh, smacked on each occasion, but they haven't changed their basic model because they're actually flourishing or thriving on this model, just introducing things immediately. And thus you see the kind of flow of information um, and the kind of way that it meshes with contemporary uh, American politics. Say there that Trump's 2016 campaign was basically a social uh, media campaign, and I suspect that future elections will similarly be uh, social media campaigns. One of Hillary Clinton's uh, mistakes in 2016 was she did not make use of social media the way um, he did. And what does that mean? Well, it basically means identifying particular uh, voter blocks based on their likes, interests, friends, etc., and then just chucking a bunch of stories and uh, statements at them. Again, with these algorithms, social media, it's easy to identify these blocks and demographics in advance. It is easy online to tell the sorts of people who will, say, potentially vote for Trump or always vote for Trump or who would never vote for Trump. You could just tell just by looking at their page. The information is all laid out there. So if you find your target group, just throw a bunch of statements and stories at them. It doesn't matter if they're true or not because it's gonna mesh with what they already believe. Any kind of random conspiracy theory will slot right into the person's predis predispositions and the prefabricated narrative that is uh, running through their mind. And the immediacy of things as well. You see the way that he runs his campaign in 2016, still does it to this day, where he basically gets up there and gives this long, rambling, disjointed speech and just adjusts on the fly. The crowd responds to this thing that I just said. Okay, I'll say it again in the future. I'll kind of hammer this point about immigrants getting into America. I'll talk about it endlessly for years because that's what people are responding to. If I say something and people don't respond, we'll just chuck it from the speech. So everything becomes kind of immediate and free-flowing. It's a kind of model of information in contemporary society. The facts and the truth, of course, are the first things that get dispensed in that situation. It's just about having that kind of immediate emotional impact on people who already have made up their minds about what they uh, believe. And the other thing, too, of course, in 2016 is that Trump could uh, navigate through the filtering mechanism. As I said, you can identify people in advance who are never going to vote for him, not in a million years. Okay, so what do you do with those people? Just throw a bunch of negative stories at them, negative stories about Hillary Clinton, for instance. It's a kind of way of uh, preventing them from voting at all. So all of these things, I would say, are curbing the uh, flow of information. And it's an ongoing process and a kind of worrisome process as well because we don't know what direction it's going to take us in uh, the future. But here's a point that I'll repeat. Those in positions of authority, wealth, and power, they do not like the free flow of information. They don't like democratic information, so to speak. They'd much rather try to control it or curb it as best they can. So um, I want to make a start with this to ensure we're able to get through the uh, material in um, the next class. And this is going to take us into our final uh, topic. We've talked about uh, 
the 20th century and the 2000s, but what about the future as well? And here is a, a subject that I'm going to uh, link to science. So here's the itinerary for, well, today and also um, uh, next time. I'm going to talk about extinction events, science and the fate of humanity, the Big Bang and the origins and uh, future of uh, the universe. And, well, suffice to say, the uh, material in the class has already been broad, right, because it deals with British and European uh, cultural history, and we've dealt with global cultural history to an extent. And here we are getting even uh, broader than that up to the level of, I don't know, what's this cosmic cultural history, if such a thing um, even exists. But I think since we've been talking about the kind of... Um, origins of humanity and things that are going to happen in the future, it is important to kind of pause for a moment and think about our place in the grand scheme of uh, everything. And so that's what I'm going to discuss with this. So the first thing um, to discuss, um, extinction events, and I want to bring this up because it has been said that we are living through an extinction event today in uh, the present uh, moment. It's even been dubbed something, the Holocene extinction event. When I say an extinction event, that refers to a, a large-scale drop in uh, biodiversity where you have a lot of animals, plant life too, potentially dying over a short uh, period of time. And this has become something very relevant when we talk about um, in the environment and the impact that humanity is having on uh, the ecosystem. It's called the Holocene extinction event because in the contemporary moment, the perception is that this extinction event is being uh, driven by a specific uh, species, namely us. And that's really the only time in the history of the Earth that a single uh, species has been responsible for triggering what could be called an extinction event. Yes, other animals have hunted out other animals. That does happen. But this kind of wide-ranging impact is really something uh, quite uh, new. And I think we should kind of frame it within uh, the larger uh, context. Well, if we are indeed living through an extinction event uh, right now, it is not the first one in the history of the planet Earth, and I would wager it's not going to be the last one um, either. There you see a list of the various um, extinction events that have occurred uh, across uh, millions of years, since the time that the planet was habitable. Again, this is a lot of animals, wildlife dropping over a particular period of time. And the, of course, most famous one is the extinction event that happened at the end of the Cretaceous period. 66 million years ago, that was the extinction of the dinosaurs, the non-avian dinosaurs, which I'm going to talk a little bit about. So we're kind of linked to those creatures a little bit. But that wasn't actually the biggest extinction event um, in the history of our planet. The biggest one occurred here 250 million years ago at the end of the uh, Permian period. This extinction event at the end of the Permian period, colloquially known as the um, a Great Dying, which is a very kind of apt term considering about 95% of the biomass on the Earth died during um, this uh, period. We don't actually know what caused this extinction event 250 million years ago, just too far back in time for us really uh, to be certain, although volcanic activity has been cited as a likely culprit, kind of relevant when uh, you live in Iceland, right, <laughs> to think about that. What kind of uh, creatures, what kind of animals were inhabiting our planet 250 uh, million years ago? Well, here's an example of um, one, potentially. It is a giant uh, prehistoric uh, dragonfly, a dragonfly that would have had a wingspan of about uh, two feet is obviously a very large bug, would have made um, a kind of uh, interesting sight. Unfortunately, uh, not around. Insects are kind of the original inhabitants of our planet. Here long before we were, and I would wager they're going to be here long after we're uh, gone. As I say, we don't know what caused the great dying necessarily, but we do have a fair degree of confidence that we do know what caused the previous big extinction event uh, 66 uh, million uh, years ago when uh, the dinosaurs uh, went extinct. If you're wondering, there's a rendition of what the planet Earth might have looked like 66 million years ago. Not the same as today due to continental drift, everything continuously uh, in motion. Um, sort of recognizable. You can get a sense of the continents there that will become familiar to us, but you might note that the um, Atlantic Ocean appears to be uh, much uh, narrower at this time, the Pacific Ocean much uh, vaster. That island there is actually India on a collision course with the Eurasian uh, landmass. 
Temperatures warmer at this time, more tropical conditions that existed, and of course, most notably, the planet uh, was uh, filled with these dinosaurs, these massive creatures, magnificent creatures that had already been there for uh, millions of years. Well, their fate was uh, caught up with an interloper, not something that uh, necessarily emerged from within the Earth's um, ecosystem, but a kind of external event, which is kind of a fascinating uh, thing. This was something that came from the reaches of space. It was an asteroid. It is typically the um, accepted uh, theory as to what happened uh, to the dinosaurs, and they've been able to piece together in um, some detail uh, what this asteroid might have been like and what it might have caused to happen. It is thought to have been uh, 10 to 15 uh, kilometers across in length, which is obviously a very big chunk of rock, larger than uh, Mount Everest even. Um, that's in terms of its length, kind of the uh, height at which an airplane would fly. So you can think about that the next time you're on an airplane. If, you're, um, if there's no cloud cover, you can see the ground below. Look out the window and think to yourself, as the base of the asteroid was striking the Earth, the top of it would have been level with the uh, wings of the airplane. That's how big this thing was. And it might have struck the Earth at a speed of uh, 70,000 uh, kilometers an hour. And... You could say that the, uh, the uh, dinosaurs at the time, had they been looking up at the skies and paying attention, I don't know if they were, probably not, right? But if they had been, they could have seen the asteroid uh, coming a couple of days in advance. Well, it would have appeared initially as just another star in um, the sky. But as it starts to close in, growing brighter and brighter, brighter than any object in the sky, even the moon, casting a visible glow on the surface of the ground. Here's a recreation of how it might have appeared seconds before impact. At this point, you would have been able to see its progress across the sky and also the shape of it, too, as it's turning, closing in on uh, the Earth. So you can imagine you know, if the dinosaurs could think in that way. Gosh, that thing looks like it's coming towards us this way. And it does enters the Earth's atmosphere and uh, strikes the surface of the Earth, as I say, at uh, 70,000 uh, kilometers an hour. This thing, this piece of rock, hit the ground so hard that it would have vaporized on impact, notwithstanding its enormous size and density. It hit the ground so hard that it would have triggered earthquakes on the opposite side of the globe and a massive blast of air as well. Tsunamis would have radiated out from the site and it would have ejected a trillions of tons of dust, soot, ash, and gravel up into the atmosphere in this uh, giant, massive mushroom cloud. And that dust famously would have blanketed the surface of the Earth for many years afterwards, disrupting the sun sunlight, disrupting the process of photosynthesis, thus causing a lot of the plant life to die, basically interrupting the entire uh, ecosystem. But even before that would have happened, a lot of the matter, a lot of the dust and sand that had been spat up into the atmosphere would have come raining back down to the surface, glowing incandescent, basically burning up as it falls back to the ground, thus igniting widespread forest fires basically turning it into a kind of version of the apocalypse. Some estimates indicate that fully a half of the Earth's biomass was incinerated within months, just cooked in this giant apocalyptic event that occurred. It's basically accepted, of course, that this is the event that wiped out the dinosaurs, an extinction event that would have killed off every animal that was uh, larger than a small dog, with a few exceptions, such as the uh, ancestors of modern crocodiles, Turns out crocodiles are uh, great survivors. Most of the large animals just died at this time. And you see the crater, which they believe uh, to have located, which corresponds to the impact um, site. The impact would have released more, than, more energy than one billion atomic bombs, specifically the ones used by the U.S. in uh, World War II. So there's something to think about for a moment. You think about the Holocene extinction event today. This is certainly the kind of slow burn process through fossil fuels, through climate change, having an adverse impact on the climate, but obviously also um, deforestation, all of those things having an impact on uh, wildlife, the habitats of animals, and something that I brought up before, the idea that among certain kinds of animals, larger animals, I guess you could say, there are 
some that thrive in close proximity to us and others that do not. This is a slow, gradual process over time. And we're not really sure um, what direction that's going to take us in, in the future. But if you want a piece of good news, well, the fact of the matter is we're not duplicating the impact of a single asteroid impact. We don't have the ability to construct one billion atomic bombs. I'm not sure why we'd want to. And even logistically, we could not detonate them all simultaneously. So the outer cosmos, the natural world, is capable of being much more destructive than we are as a species. So something to uh, think about moving forward. You see the um, studies indicating that 40% of the mammals on Earth have suffered large levels of decline, up to an 80% reduction in their numbers over the past 100 years, basically giving you an idea of the impact of us humans on the environment. So I mean, thought about um, that as an extinction event. I mean, it certainly makes us dwell on this question of science and the fate of humanity. What exactly is going to be our fate? What is going to be the future of um, humanity? And uh, this opens up a range of different uh, subjects we could discuss. And of course, we have to be a little bit judicious in choosing particular ones. You see Stephen Hawking, a British uh, physicist, cosmologist, and uh, theorist who battled uh, courageously against Lou Gehrig's disease for uh, many years became well known for his study of uh, black holes. There's a couple uh, topics to go through. Science and the fate of humanity, the fate of the Earth, the lifespan of humanity, question of is there life on other planets, and also is there life like us on other planets as well. So, the Earth is certainly in continuous motion. Ecosystem is in continuous motion and evolutionary processes are ongoing. We have not reached any kind of uh, static uh, cutoff point right now. Well, continental drift, for instance, is going to continue well into the future. We don't know exactly what's going to happen. There is one estimate of how the Earth will look 100 uh, million years uh, from now. And moving way forward in time, there's one estimate of how the Earth will look one a billion years from now, at which point all life will have ceased. In theory, our planet should remain habitable for about another one billion years. Now, that's not a guarantee, because there are events that could basically end all life on this planet. For instance, a sufficiently large asteroid, something um, in the length of 100 kilometers, for instance, will be enough to vaporize the oceans, effectively ending life. But assuming that something like that doesn't happen, well, then you can have animal life, plant life, etc., surviving for another one billion years. Probably not us, right? But nonetheless, other creatures that will come um, afterwards. Nonetheless, there will come a point where the sun's energy and output increases to a level where it starts to raise the temperatures of our planet um, to such a level that the oceans will evaporate. And this is something that is basically assured to happen in the future. And um, as far as we understand it, you need water in order to have life. So if the oceans evaporate, then our planet will become incapable of sustaining life. There's some theories that that's actually what happened to a planet that's very uh, close to us, Venus, second planet from the sun, similar to the Earth in uh, some respects, at least in terms of its uh, size, but it is a broiling hot place, totally incapable of sustaining life. We don't even try to send uh, rovers or spacecraft to Venus because the surface is so hot that it basically melts the stuff that you try to land on it. And that is uh, thanks to a vast uh, blanket of gases that coat Venus, creating this giant greenhouse gas effect well, some have speculated that in the distant past, Venus was actually covered in oceans, maybe even had life, but those evaporated at some point in the past, turning it into this uh, barren, uninhabitable place. Moving forward into the kind of long-term uh, future of the planet, there's an artist's rendition of the Earth's uh, surface during the red giant phase of our sun. This is what will happen to the sun in the future. It will continue to expand and uh, grow due to changes within its workings, its mechanisms. It will become uh, dimmer and larger and this kind of giant uh, glowing red uh, sphere. 
In about 5 billion years, the sun will expand into this red giant. Its surface area will be up to 250 times larger than it is today, and in all likelihood, it will completely swallow the Earth. So that's basically what's going to happen to this planet. We're standing on, in all likelihood, will be burnt to a crisp in the sun, may potentially get ejected from its orbit. That's also a possibility, but it'll be drift through space as this uh, barren uh, rock. We think about um, the story of humanity's um, lifespan as well. Well, how long are we actually going to last as um, a species? Well, impossible to say. This is something I've mentioned before. We can't really see the future. Um, I don't think it'll be another one billion years, right? The complete span of um, the degree to which our planet will be um, habitable. But there's really no way for us to uh, know for certain. But here's a kind of you know thought experiment type of uh, question just to put to you, and I have absolutely no answer to this particular question. It's just something to uh, contemplate. If we go on the dates of the cognitive revolution, say 50,000 years ago, that was basically when um, Homo sapiens emerged as this particular species. As I mentioned, the genetics, the DNA of the species were in place, but that's when kind of modern humanity emerged. Okay, so 50,000 years ago, and here we are at this particular moment in time. If you had to guess would you think that we are near the beginning of our stage as a species, near the middle of it, or near the end of it? And as I say, there's no answer to that question. It's just something to think about. Are we kind of near the beginning, meaning we're going to last for a lot longer, maybe hundreds of thousands of years, millions of years? Are we somewhere in the middle, meaning we're going to last another 50,000 years? Or are we close to the end of it, meaning we're not going to last much longer? I would say that however you think about that kind of changes our perception of what's going to happen to us in uh, the future. No answer. As I say, we can't see the future, don't know. The question of um, life for us, but also life on other uh, planets, and this is the kind of topic that I want to get into as well, because here's another question that has um, pressed on us a long time. Is there life on other uh, planets? So we make the assumption that um, humanity is uh, kind of this species that will not last forever, but it does kind of raise that question about other species similar to us on um, other planets. So, as I say, let's just begin with that basic question. Is there life on other planets? The answer, I would say, is almost certainly. I mean, it's almost kind of beyond dispute, beyond doubt, that there should be other organic life on different uh, planets out there in uh, the universe. And this is one of those things where it's really just the sheer uh, weight of numbers that gives us a sense that that probably should be the answer. Our galaxy, the galaxy that we're currently in right now, that our sun is located in, contains hundreds of billions of stars. The top end estimate right now is uh, something like 400 uh, billion uh, stars, some of which are larger than the sun, many of which are smaller, some that are brighter, some that are uh, dimmer, some older, some younger, but just a vast array of other uh, stars. There are probably at least as many planets as stars out there, though it is impossible to know for certain. And the reason for that is that people who study these things claim that the formation of planets is a typical part of a star's life cycle. If you have a star, then you should have planets, at least at some stage, orbiting around it. So by that logic, you not only have 400 billion uh, stars potentially, but also hundreds of billions of planets as well. Now. Let's widen the frame a little bit even further. Not so long ago, we were talking about 100 uh, billion observable uh, galaxies in uh, the universe, in terms of the total number of galaxies out there. That number I saw was recently upgraded to 2 trillion, in terms of the number of galaxies. Thus, let's say star systems average three planets. That's a low estimate. Our own uh, solar system has um, eight planets in it. Apologies to Pluto for its uh, demotion. And that the Milky Way is an average size for galaxies. Estimates, uh, estimated number of planets out there, 2.4 quintillion. That's a 2 and a 4 with, um, I think, a 17 uh, zeros after it. So, basically, while all this says is that unless you want to make the argument that the Earth is a 1 in 2.4 quintillion shot, then I would wager that you are going to find other planets out there that are capable of supporting life. The odds simply suggest that. Not only that, 
But there's also this question of what exactly are we looking for when we start speaking about um, a planet that is uh, capable of uh, sustaining uh, life? What's really the kind of magic ingredient here? Well, water is usually the kind of simplest response. We look at the other planets in our uh, solar system and we basically come to the conclusion that they're not capable of supporting life because none of the others have liquid water or significant amounts of liquid water on uh, their surface. By contrast, the Earth is a very watery world. The vast majority of its surface is covered in water and that explains why it's such a fertile fecund place. Water is the elixir of life, as far as we understand it. Not just here, but presumably on any planet we might think about in the galaxy or the universe. Water is this kind of uh, magic soup that allows for a complex level of molecular interaction that allows organisms to form. The problem with a just big ball of rock like Mars does not allow enough interaction among molecules. A giant ball of gas like Jupiter allows plenty of interaction, but it's too diffuse, whereas water allows it to kind of hit that sweet spot where you can have the development, the growth of uh, living organisms. In theory, water should not be super scarce in the universe. Now, it's a kind of unique thing in this uh, solar system, but that's partly because of the temperature of our planet. Its climate is conducive to it. But when you think about it on a kind of uh, broad scale, water should not be this thing that is uh, really scarce to find. And the reason people say that is because we look at the case study of uh, the Earth itself. Imagine if water was a very scarce, rare substance on our planet. Imagine if life had kind of sprung out of something that is a very rare and difficult to find. Well, we say, well, life really has a kind of uphill struggle to even make its appearance because it emerges out of something that is very limited. That is not the case, though. Think of the vastness of the oceans, rivers, seas, the water cycle. Again, yeah, it explains why there's so much life on our planet. You look at the history of our planet across millions and millions of years, all sorts of life forms. It's a very fertile, fecund place. And it might be the case that other planets would be similar, and it gives the sort of sense that water should not be a kind of incredibly unusual thing to find. Not only that, but of course water is a simple compound of hydrogen and oxygen. So assuming that you have the right weather conditions, not too hot, not too cold, then it should be a possibility to find it on other uh, planets. Now you have an artistic rendering of Kepler-62e, which is a planet located 1,200 light years from the Earth. Scientists speculate that it may be covered in oceans. They don't know that, but that is a speculative idea. Of course, they're working on trying to get a better mapping and imaging of planets outside of our solar system. Very difficult task for them to accomplish. Water in uh, the solar system, well, not on the other planets as far as we can um, tell because temperature conditions, climate conditions are not uh, conducive to it. But we shouldn't rule it out altogether. It is actually a possibility on at least one of the moons in uh, the solar system. There you have an image of Europa, which is a uh, moon of Jupiter, one of the many moons of Jupiter that is slightly smaller than our own moon. And you might note that uh, telltale kind of aqua color to it. And that is because scientists uh, speculate that that is a big giant sheet of glacial ice covering the surface of uh, this moon, like a giant sphere of ice, effectively. And scientists speculate that it may harbor a vast ocean beneath its surface. So you have the frozen ice on the surface and perhaps water beneath the surface. And ever since they've uh, twigged upon that particular discovery, they are, of course, very interested in sending uh, space probes and rovers to Europa to check out the situation there and to see whether, perhaps, Below the surface of the ice is possible of some kind of living organisms, bacteria, whatever it might be, actually alive in this kind of potential ocean beneath Europa's surface. And you might ask, well, how is that the case? I mean, Europa, Jupiter, I mean, isn't that way the hell out there? Isn't it freezing cold in that surface? Well, yes, that is the case. It's freezing cold. But a kind of um, interesting dynamic here, it is thanks to the immense gravitational pull of Jupiter, this massive 
planet. It is um, uh, squeezing and flexing this moon, and it's creating a lot of kind of tectonic activity, almost like um, geothermal energy. Geo refers to the Earth. And it's a different uh, moon, but nonetheless, that gives you the idea. And it's keeping the water in motion, keeping it a liquid. So it's not the temperature itself, but rather the movement beneath the surface that is perhaps creating this um, ocean on this moon. So as I say, I think they're already putting together these missions to send out space probes and to check out the situation on Europa. Very curious to do that. Can't send a person out there, at least not today. But nonetheless, we can take a look at the technology. Last thing I'll mention today, obviously we're very uh, interested in imaging or sighting planets outside of uh, the uh, solar uh, system. I mean, that would be kind of transformative in giving us a sense of, okay, what's it really like out there in the vast reaches? We know the solar system uh, well enough. We are familiar enough with the planets here. We kind of know what's available to us and what's not. But what are other star systems like? What are other uh, planets like? Well, obviously that's a kind of ongoing process to try and get direct images of planets outside of our solar system, but it is an immense challenge for them to do that, even with the best um, technology, the best uh, telescopes. And the reason is not strictly the distances, although that's a part of it, it's the luminous glow of the stars. When you're looking into a star system at a great distance, all you're going to see is this giant glowing light coming from the star, and it's basically drowning everything out. The example I've heard them give, it's kind of like trying to sight a uh, firefly that's flying close to one of these giant searchlights, because that's basically the equivalent glow of the planet compared to the star. So again, the distance plays a role there, but it's really just the fact of trying to penetrate this giant wall of light to see what's underneath. And that's why we haven't really had direct images of planets, but we certainly have had detections of planets. They know that particular planets are there based on looking at um, other factors, but the actual direct sight, the picture, that's still a uh, work in progress. Okay, so that's enough for today. We'll come back um, next time and finish up with the rest of this lecture. It might not be a full class, depends how long it takes to get through uh, the material, but um, enjoy the rest of the week.